Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending the latest in a series of public events in 2021 by the Michael V. Hayden Center for Intelligence, Policy, and International Security. And you're in for a treat tonight. I am Mark Roselle, and I serve as the Dean of the Shar School of Policy and Government here at George Mason University. And we are very proud to host the Hayden Center. The academic calendar year may have just finished up, but the Hayden Center just keeps going. Tonight, we have over 800 persons signed up from all over the United States and internationally. Participants specifically are from 41 states and the District of Columbia, as well as 28 countries, six continents, and 40 different colleges and universities. The Hayden Center is part of a larger security studies emphasis in the Shar School. We have as well the Center for Security Policy Studies, directed by Professor Ellen Lapson, who also directs our International Security Studies Master's Degree Program. And that has been a top 10 program nationally for four years running in the US News and World Report rankings. We are fortunate to have many leading scholars and practitioner teachers in our International Security Studies Master's Degree Program. And related to that, by the way, is our unique program in biodefense studies and given its emphasis on infectious diseases and public policies to combat those, you can imagine interest in that program has grown substantially. Additionally, we have a very generous gift from the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation, supporting scholarships for Shar School students in security studies fields, such as the two degree programs that I just mentioned. And the Hayden Center, of course, honors its founder, General Michael V. Hayden, who has been on our faculty for the past 11 years. I would like to now welcome the executive director of the Hayden Center, Larry Pfeiffer, the past director of the White House Situation Room, and he will introduce our program. Larry. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, to those folks out there who are from the Shar School, from George Mason University and other universities, congratulations on getting through another semester. It's been a crazy year. We are hoping we're putting it behind us. And when we come back in the fall, uh, we're actually gonna be able to spend some time together in person. Uh, for those of you, we got a lot of people attending today. So I think we got some new folks. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Hayden Center, uh, we were founded about three and a half, almost four years ago now uh, by General Hayden. And uh, our goal is to kind of take the mystery out of intelligence, um, better explain the role it plays in supporting policymakers and our national and homeland security communities. We do that largely through events like this. Uh, before the pandemic, most of our events, all of our events were in person. Uh, we hope to get back to those in-person events uh, late summer or into the early fall. So stay tuned for that. Uh, all of our presentations, whether they were in person or virtual are available on our YouTube channel. So if you're interested in seeing other events like this one, go to the channel and you'll see plenty, plenty there to watch. Uh, we're very active on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Welcome you guys uh, connecting there and following us. A uh, little administrative remark uh, tonight, uh, as we, we're gonna proceed with a moderated conversation for, for a period of time, but at a certain point, uh, we are gonna take audience questions. So if you have questions, uh, please use the Q&A box in your Zoom tool to type your question and send it to us. Uh, don't use the chat box to send questions because we're not gonna monitor that one as closely. Um, if you wish to be identified, uh, please put your name, put your organization. We would especially ask our journalist friends out there to please identify yourself if you are a journalist uh, and we can uh, mention uh, what magazine or news service you belong to. Thank you. Um, the future of intelligence, a uh, heck of a topic to be discussing right now. Uh, myself, many of my colleagues really look at uh, the intelligence business at a, as at a serious point of inflection. Um, in, in many, many different ways. Um, we are looking at a, um, a, va a vast and wider array of targets. We, you know, we've been dedicated to counterterrorism as our primary emphasis for most of the last couple of decades. Uh, but now we're looking at uh, Russia, China, uh, Iran, North Korea. Um, you know, how much emphasis should we be putting on those? How much emphasis should, would that take away from counterterrorism? We have transnational issues that are growing uh, in importance, cyber, uh, public health, pandemics, um, climate change, uh, how much emphasis and investment needs to be put into those areas. Um, we have a great debate going on uh, in our community about open source information versus secrets. Should we, should we be investing our energy in open source 
given the large volumes of material that's available, or should we be leaving that to the private sector and, and perhaps investing and focusing our energy on those true secrets that cannot be obtained in any kind of uh, open manner? Uh, then there's technology. Uh, there's a lot of technology. It's moving very fast. It's moving dramatically. Uh, what are the implications of uh, harnessing that technology with regards to analysis, with regards to collection, with regards to clandestine and covert operations? Um, how does it change how the intelligence community and customers of the intelligence community interact and get, get information? Um, that all then drives questions of talent. You know, what are the competencies we're really looking for now? How has that changed? What happens to the folks who've been working 20 to 30 years and then now they got to do something different or use technologies they're not familiar with? And then, and, and more and more over time that the competition from the private sector for that same talent pool has grown, grown fierce. Uh, so tonight, I'm gonna, gonna bring to you a panel here that brings literally hundreds of years of intelligence experience and leadership to the table. Uh, all of them have led their agencies through uh, transformative journeys, and they can maybe go into more detail on that if they care. Um, in terms of our panel members, we have Michael Morell, who's gonna serve as a moderator. Michael's a senior fellow here at the Hayden Center, uh, but uh, more importantly, he served as deputy director of CIA from 2010 to 2013, twice was our acting director. Uh, he spent a good period of time as director of intelligence, uh, all culminating from uh, many, many years uh, as, uh, as an analyst and senior analyst. Um, John Brennan, uh, also of, of CIA, director of CIA from 2013 to 2017. He was President Obama's Homeland Security Advisor from 09 to 13. He founded and became the director of what became the National Counterterrorism Center. Uh, and uh, important to us, he was a Hayden Center guest in November 2019 for a panel that uh, made quite a bit of news uh, at the time. So you may want to go check that one out. Uh, Robert Cardillo, director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, which from this point on, I will just call NGA from 2014 to 2019. Uh, just before that, he served as the first deputy director of uh, National Intelligence for Intelligence Integration uh, from 2010 to 2014. He had a, a, a fantastic career, DIA and NGA. He served as deputy director and director of analysis at DIA from 06 uh, to 10. Served as senior leader in all of CIA's directorates. Um, and uh, is famous for having designed and driven the development of InQtel, uh, which is a private nonprofit innovation incubator uh, delivering tech solutions to the IC. Uh, she is also has the distinction of being the last in-person Hayden Center guest back in February of 2020 before this pandemic hit us. Uh, General Hayden, uh, our last panel member, director of CIA from 2006 to 2009, he was the first Principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence uh, from 05 to 06, served as the Deputy uh, sir, sorry, served as the Director of the National Security Agency from 1999 to 2005, at that time the longest serving director. Uh, he led the Air Intelligence Agency before that, served as a Deputy Chief of Staff in Korea, uh, was the US European Command J2. Um, he was the founder of the Hayden Center almost four years ago and is a visiting professor here at Shar School. Now, many of you realize, uh, remember General Hayden uh, had a pretty serious stroke a few years ago, back in the late 2018. Uh, so uh, he's made a heck of a comeback, uh, but he does have a condition that many stroke victims have uh, called aphasia that affects his speech. So uh, there may be times tonight where he you know, has to dig a little harder to find the word or the phrase. So uh, he asks your, uh, your indulgence there. Um, the, the key thing to remember is aphasia does not affect the intellect or the knowledge. And uh, uh, all the time I've spent with General Hayden the last few years, I can attest to that being very, very true. Um, lastly, and before, before we turn to the guests, I did want to mention uh, a outfit that has been very, very helpful to General Hayden the last uh, few years is something called the Stroke Comeback Center. And today is a special day of fundraising at the Stroke Comeback Center. Uh, so if you're listening to us or when you're finished listening to us, if you go to strokecomebackcenter.org, uh, they have a donate button. You click on that button, you'll be donating to help an organization that's helped to get General Hayden back to where he is today. Uh, and importantly, you're going to be helping all those other folks who are working hard to come back to their uh, maximum potential. So with that, I do turn it over to General Hayden for uh, some brief hellos, and, uh, and then Michael will begin the program. 
So thanks, everybody. Okay, Michael, that's going to be a real, I'm looking forward to this. Michael, thank you again. Larry, thank you again. This is going to be awesome. So, Mike, you have it. Great. Thank you, General Hayden. Um, so this is really special for me, um, you know, to, to be with this amazing group, um, people I worked for, people I worked with, um, everyone um, I consider a friend. Um, so I think this is going to be a terrific conversation, and um, I'm really looking forward to it. So I want to start with what I think most people would consider an easy question, but may generate, may generate, I'm not so sure, but may generate a little debate among our panel. Um, and that is with regard to the mission of the intelligence community. You know, it has always been to collect information, some of it clandestinely, some of it not, um, to analyze that information and to paint a unbiased by politics or unbiased by policy picture of the world that the policymakers um, in both the executive branch and Congress and those who carry out that policy, right, in the military or law enforcement or what have you, um, to give them um, a picture of the world, a picture of the situation they face, a picture of the threat, a picture of the opportunity. Um, and occasionally, when the president asks for it, uh, to take action on the president's behalf, we call it covert action, to take action on the president's behalf to change a situation on the ground somewhere, right, to further a president's policy objective. That has long been the mission. So my question to the panel is, is that still the mission? Or do you think the mission needs to change? Um, and I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start with Sue in terms of answering this question. Um, well, one, I'm I'm with you, Michael. I'm I'm sitting in a room with uh, uh, people that all of whom I worked for. I may be the only one who can say that. Um, and all whom I could uh, consider friends. So I'm delighted to be here and we'll have a great romp through the night. Um, my definition of the mission of intelligence is to know the truth, to see beyond the horizon, and to allow leaders to act before events dictate. Um, so let's break that down a little bit. What is the truth? Um, to me, the truth is what is rather than what you prefer it to be. What is rather than that is what is presented to you. So some ability to have that objective view without judgment of whether it's good, not good, right, wrong, but it just what is. See beyond the horizon. You know, when we first started this game, or at least when I did, the horizon was a physical horizon. We tossed stuff up in the air so we could see what was going on in the Soviet landmass. Um, I think that there's a digital horizon that we're trying to see beyond. I think there's a temporal horizon that we're trying to at least have some contextual information so that we can, if not no intent, infer intent. And then the ability to, to wow. give information to leaders so they can act before events dictate. And what I mean by that is that is the greatest advantage that we provide is knowing a little bit more, a little bit sooner so that a leader has a running start on making a decision rather than having their hand forced by events. I don't think there's anything about the, that which I've described that is irrelevant today or tomorrow. I do think the modality of how you achieve that is vastly different. And I think we'll talk about that, but from a straight mission perspective, that's how I see it. I think it's relevant, but I think how you do it is really different today from how we did it in 1947 or 61 or 89 or 2001. And I think that's the fun to talk about now. So I've heard you once or twice mention that you think the American people are a customer of the intelligence community. And did I get that right? And how do you think about that? Uh, so they're the ones that give us our authority. Um, they're the one whose interests we're ultimately serving. So I've always thought that the American people, um, we owe them 
are honored because they entrust us with special authorities. Now I see it even more clearly, now that the threat surface has expanded beyond governments to private industry and to individuals with the digital environment, with cybercrime and influence activities, I think then we have to be even more directly sharing what we know because their ability to understand the challenges and threats we face without the lens of policy, politics, I think is really important. But I'll say, Michael, I don't think that the tradecraft of talking to the American people is the same as the tradecraft of talking to governments and policymakers. So I think we need to, and they are a direct customer, but I think we're still in our nascent in terms of how to do that. We still, when we talk directly to the American people, we sound like bad unclassified, right? And we're gonna just have to get better than that. We, we can't talk in our arcane language that we've honed over the years. Um, but do I think we need to get that information to the American people? Because in some cases, they're the best ones to secure America. I do. Robert? Um, so first, I just have to join Sue and Revel in this uh, environment. Um, General Hayden, it's always a privilege to spend time with you and be in your presence. And then John and uh, Michael, just, just wonderful. Um, it is going to be fun, and Sue's already made it so. Um, Michael, I have a quick answer to your question. It gets to the same place as Sue, and I say no, our mission has not changed at all, because I equate our mission with the outcome. Not, not our outcome, but the nation's outcome. And so I believe our profession exists to advantage decision. And, and, and we either do that, we're either there at the time, we present the material in a way that frames or creates insight or understanding, or maybe just narrows confusion a little bit so they can make just a little better decision. So again, to me, that's our mission, hasn't changed. Uh, I, I got to stop following Sue in this broadcast. Okay. And everything else has changed, right? <laughs> everything. Right, we'll get to that. We'll, and, and, and we'll get to that everything else. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's fine. This is fine. Yeah, um, well, um, let me just say, I am so honored to be part of this panel and especially anything that is associated with the Hayden Center. Uh, I, I jump at the opportunity to do so because Mike Hayden is just such a intelligence icon that uh, I think we all learned so much from him over the years. Uh, and I will associate myself with both Sue and Robert's comments. Um, that digital domain, which didn't exist really when I joined CIA back in 1980, uh, has I think fundamentally uh, changed uh, the, the nature of intelligence work because of all of the challenges, the threats, the opportunities that exist in that environment, because that is the place where most human activity takes place. Uh, but then also when I think back, when I started out in 1980, we were still in the Cold War. Uh, although I agree with Robert that, you know, we're still into ensuring that the outcomes are going to advance US national security. The types of things that we're dealing with these days, whether it is pandemics or climate change, other types of transnational and, and global issues. Uh, I think it's much more at the forefront uh, for intelligence professionals in terms of what they need to do to give that decision advantage which is, I think, what Sue was referring to, ensure that policymakers, the ones that sort of hold our safety, security, and prosperity in their hands, have as much insight as possible into the truth as we know it, so they can chart the way ahead for, for our country. So how do you all think about the range of issues that Larry outlined? Um, how do you think about where the IC needs to put its focus, put its resources. And let me ask a very specific question with regard to that issue. Um, should China become what the Soviet Union was to the intelligence community, right? Should it infuse um, almost everything that we do? Um, how do you think about 
you know, China as the defining challenge and then how the IC approaches that um, and how the resource allocation should work given the large number of other issues that are out there. Um, so John, let's start with you this time. The United States, I think is unique in the world in terms of its global responsibilities, which means that the intelligence community then in the United States has to be prepared to deal with the, all of the issues that might arise on that global stage. And so it's, you know, we referred in the past to uh, five-year-old soccer that, you know, when the soccer ball goes to one end of the field, all those little legs scurry to that one end of the field. But in the intelligence community, you really cannot do that. So I agree that China demands a very prominent and almost dominant sort of focus as far as resource allocation and the interests of, of the intelligence community. At the same time, though, there are so many other issues. And what we don't want to do is to deprive some of these other issues of the necessary resources, the, the capabilities that exist. Unfortunately, back in the 1990s, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Michael, as you well know, and others, you know, there was an effort to downsize the intelligence community, including our presence abroad. And that presence abroad really takes quite a bit of time to develop. And if you reduce that, you're not going to have those the same opportunity as far as whether you're talking about human assets or technical capabilities or other types of things. So this is where I think the real challenge comes to intelligence community leaders. I know I felt it. How do you allocate a finite amount of resources across the global stage that is both dynamic as well as has some enduring intelligence challenges that you always need to continue to focus on? And that's where I think the challenge in the, in the decades ahead is going to lie. And John, how did, you, how did you try to do that when you were the director? <laughs> well, when you were my deputy, I'd ask you for advice, Michael, <laughs> and then Sue and Robert and others. Well, this is where I think there really needs to be a interaction between the intelligence community leadership and policymakers, because obviously, you know, our first customer is the president of the United States, and you want to make sure that that national security team, the ones that actually are executing policies and developing them, they're going to have the benefit of the intelligence input. So what we wouldn't do in the intelligence community is just, you know, change the dial on our own whim. We understood what some of these enduring intelligence challenges are, but at the same time, we needed to be able to support the near-term demands of policymakers. And so as we would fine tune our collection capabilities and our analytic capabilities, we would have to do it in concert with those folks that would sit around that uh, White House Situation Room table and uh, debate these issues, particularly in the beginning of an administration. And I know this first year of the Biden administration, that's what they're doing. They're trying to recalibrate or fine tune those intelligence capabilities according to policy priorities. Robert? Um, I, I largely agree with John on, on the China question. And at the risk of being one of those five-year-old kids though, I'll just say, I think it's the clearest threat to our long-term position in the globe. And while I completely agree that, that we, we have to cover the other angles of threats and, and you know, one of which uh, Sue already spoke about, the, the misuse and the, and, the, and the perturbation of our digital fabric to undermine you know, governance and confidence, that I do think it's appropriate not akin to the Soviet Union. I think that was a different time and a different model, but that, and, and I'm fine with John's phrase of dominant, dominant focus. I'll also remind though that sometimes, you know, people will say, well, the, you know, they'll use the term IC priorities. And I'll go, no, that's incorrect, right? The intelligence community has no priorities other than our customers. And so, from, from the president on down, we have to reflect that. And so again, I, I think we need to be tuning right now. I think we need to be prepared. And I know we'll talk about the methods, uh, Michael, here tonight, because it, it, it's a different contest uh, with China. Um, and it's played at so many multiple levels that quite frankly, the IC was not called upon in the past to do that I think we have to ha learn new muscle movements here in order to provide that, um, you know, material insight uh, understanding so that our national security team can make the best decision to align ourselves as a nation across the board uh, to combat this, 
what I see is a as an as an existential threat. So Robert, do you do you do you think that China is in the dominant position today? Um, do you think it needs more resources, you know, across the community? Um, and if so, what would you cut, assuming you couldn't have additional resources? Fair, um, <laughs> because I often asked my policymaker customers the same question when they would add three more number ones to our list. Uh, please tell me what you would have us not do. Um, you know, Michael, I'm, I'm two plus years out. Um, I, I don't think there's been a dramatic change. Uh, so my my comments are mid 2019, and I do think I do think that broadly speaking, that's correct. Dominant uh, would be appropriate um, uh, allocation of resources. But I'm worried less about amount and more about type. Um, here's what here's what I mean. I look, um, you Michael were were brought in as an economist, um, and so we've been doing economic analysis for a long time as a community. Um, I believe, from my seat, that we have undervalued that over time, and that I think we're playing catch catch up now to raise our game to work with partners in treasury, to work with partners in the international community, and to work with, with private companies as well in a way that, that raises insight, trade, monetary policy, um, uh, international sanctions, et cetera. And, and that's where I, I worry about. And if, if you ask me where um, I, would, I would take risk uh, these days, um, uh, I, I, look, <laughs> um, this is going to be hard for me from a, a DOD defense intelligence uh, officer, but I, I have to say that I do worry that sometimes we put we put so much attention on five and ten and fifteen year uh, weapons analysis, for example, that 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 was necessary at a time, and I think the Soviet era was that time that may be misplaced. In, in an era of digital engineering, in which the timeframes for those changes are gonna be much quicker. And I just worry if, if, if our long-term R&D, and, I, and I, I feel bad already that I'm putting myself in the, you know, the camp that says that's not worthwhile, it is. But I may make a trade on that, Michael, so that I could be better at the more innovative, agile, changes that I think are going to affect us sooner and bigger. Sue? Um, trying to think of something that's additive to say. Um, listen, I, these are such remarkable times and I'm now old enough that I can say they're different and they're different in the numbers of things that we have. So we have China and global economic competitiveness and not only is China worthy of a preeminent position in our concern, but they are also a different kind of threat. In other words, applying all our trade craft of the last 70 years to China won't be enough because they're not the same. They're not the monolith that we taught against. So not only is China emergent and because of a digital economic world, a different kind of threat, the intelligence community is really gonna to have to get on its horses to be able to have the analytic foundation to really understand this threat different from an analog to the Soviet Union. So we have that. We've got the hardy perennials, you know, Russia, Russia isn't going away, North Korea, Iran, um, counterterrorism. And then we have this new set of national security concerns um, from pandemic to climate, uh, to uh, domestic extremism, to displaced persons and humanitarian crises. Those are surely national security threats. And I think there's a really interesting question that the intelligence community is gonna have to ask itself is whether it has unique capability that needs to be applied and what would that look like, which is not just another agency looking at the same thing, but it's doing something clever like 
let me look at the intersection of climate models and national security models to see what comes out. So you have that whole set of new national security issues that the intelligence community is gonna to have to figure out whether it has enough discrete advantage to warrant resources against it. And then the last thing, since we're kind of transitioning to resource issues is the intelligence community does not have the technical foundation to deal with this data world whether it is in its infrastructure, whether in its hiring, whether it's in the speed of motion, its ability to work with data. Um, it doesn't necessarily have the same, the collectors that it needs to go after the data that are gonna provide the advantage that we last had. So I think the country lay down is about right. But underneath that, there's a huge transformation, I think, that's going to have to go on to be able to understand these things that sound like they're the same, but are phenomenally different in character. General Hayden, I just want to ask if you agree with the rest of the panel that China should be the dominant focus of the community while still maintaining a capability across this broader range of issues. Yes, indeed. That is okay. Now, I was I was thinking about when I was at CIA, you know, and I would go on Monday morning and say, you know, I, I've got to go to China. I I got got to go to China, but it was it was really hard because a lot's going on. So I did it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Well, I'll do it next week and next week. And that's the problem about that. I should have done more. You know what I mean? But we couldn't do it. Yeah, no, I felt the same way. Um, I wanna ask one of, one of you, um, because I think, I think all of you made a really important point about um, how China is different than, 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 than other challenges we face, certainly different than the Soviet Union. What do we, what, what questions do we need to provide answers to, to policymakers about China for them to make the right choices um, with regard to how we deal with that country? Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Um, and you and John, you and, and Robert can fix it. Um, I remember in 1983, I went over to the Soviet Union as part of a small team that um, got in on the last flight before the KAL shoot down and we were looking for bugs in the new Soviet embassy, which of course we found and the rest is history. But what I took away from that trip, I remember sitting there on winter nights in Moscow when we work on this building thinking, oh my God, this is a third world country. Like I had been a Soviet analyst in the October parades and everything. And I remember looking at it like, ah, we're making them too big. So I think the first question that we really need to be able to answer is not just look at their absolute capability technologically, but their wherewithal to put it into action to achieve advantage and interest that counters ours. So I think we know this to be true, but right now it's such an absolute, almost a binary you know, they're ahead of us in quantum. We're, they're catching up to AI. I don't know that that's gonna be enough. I think we're gonna have to put capability into use and give that assessment so that you can shape policy because a policy of not China is not gonna work. It would be devastating in so many ways to our own innovation engine. So I think we're gonna to have to put capability into use and be good at assessing that for our policymakers to make good, clear decisions. Yeah, I would, I would, I would add, um, I really do think that uh, policymakers really need to understand the spectrum of the Chinese phenomenon in terms of the areas that we really need to be very concerned about because China does pose a threat and we consider it an adversary. And what is it doing to undermine uh, democracies around the globe and undermine US national security interests? But I think there is a spectrum. There are a lot of things that I think we can work with China on and we don't have to get into a confrontation with them. And I think the intelligence community really can serve a very useful purpose in terms of helping to educate policymakers about that broad spectrum 
of engagements with, with China. Uh, unfortunately, I think sometimes, whether you're talking about China or Iran, whatever else, they're considered to be sort of monoliths. And there's a lot going on inside of China, in the region, globally, that I think the, the intelligence community has some of the world's best experts on a lot of these issues. And so I think the more enlightened and more informed policymakers are about China and what does it mean to US interests going forward, the good, the bad, and the ugly, I think then policymakers will be able to, I think, make more informed judgments about how to engage and deal with China. Robert, thoughts? Oh yeah, so I'll see Sue and John and raise them. Um, because I did agree with th those two approaches, but I I'm gonna frame it in the State of the Union speech that our president just made, in which he said, we're, we're in a battle of ideas. And quite frankly, a democracy is now been tested like it's never been before. And what is, what is America other than that idea? that we can create a social compact between the governed and the government in a way that respects privacy and individual liberty and yet provides general security. Um, that's been tested as we know, and, and, and we can talk more about that. I think what we need to help expose quite frankly is, is the Chinese model. And uh, to John's point, it isn't monolithic. Uh, but it has quite different fundamental beliefs about that social compact. And um, I do think it's our job to do that illumination, um, um, uh, informing. In this case, I think it's both policy uh, makers and the public, frankly. Now, we should talk about how we do that and where we do that and with whom we do that. Uh, but I think because it is such a competition of ideas that part of our job is to, to frame it in a way so that people can understand the choice uh, that's at stake here. And then one, one last question about, about areas of focus. Um, I'd love to know what you all think about what the IC's role should be on um, climate change and on pandemics. Who wants to go first this time? Well, I'll take a stab at it. I, I don't think that the IC should try to replicate or to try to outdo National Science Foundation, you know, as well as the you know, CDC and other specialists in these areas. Um, but I think there are such tremendous implications of climate change and pandemics in terms of um, uh, economics, uh, in terms of political stability, in terms of interstate conflict. Uh, what is it going to mean when the, the seas rise and uh, coastal communities uh, move, have to move inland and put additional pressure on urban centers or migrate across borders? These are the types of things that I, I think that the intelligence community can assess. Not the science of it so much, although I think we do have some very you know, good scientists. But I, I think more the, the broader geostrategic implications and national security implications of these phenomena, I think this is where the uh, intelligence community really can uh, assist policymakers so that they can understand what is coming and what the real impact is going to be as, as these uh, phenomena uh, take uh, more root. Susan? Uh, I think, I think, John's got it right. It, it, you're not going to create a competitive scientific center um, at, at the, in the intelligence community. But I do think we have long known, particularly in climate, that it's part of an ecosystem of, of events that affect um, food security, uh, economic security, um, energy security, and all those things come into play. And all those things create geopolitical events that must be dealt with. And so I, I, I think we've got to get, we have long known that this was true. I think in the last couple of years, we've seen that climate change is not only strategic, there are tactical implications of it right now that have to be dealt with. So I'd, I'd put us in the question of what can we do to add to that 
insight into the interaction between national security issues and climate issues. Pandemics are interesting where I wonder in that area, one of the things that it would have been awfully nice to have was objective information about the truth and the ground truth about what was going on. Now, interesting about how we'd go after getting it, but remember, we're not stuck with the collectors that we have today. You know, there was a day where we didn't have the ability to do what we do uh, geospatially. And so I think there is in pandemics some worthwhile exploration of what data would be useful to see events coming earlier and to understand the actuality different from that which is pervaded by politicians. Robert? To me, there's no question that we should be contributing, and I like the way John put it, contributing to both issues, um, augmenting, adding where we can, providing insight when there's confusion. Because again, I go back to what to me are first principles. We have always been in the security slash insecurity business, stability slash instability. And, and what was more destabilizing in the past 18 months than this pandemic? And, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and I just say, as far as we know, it was naturally occurring an accidental transmission that led to humans and then a quick spread around the globe. Imagine, and again, Michael, I may be getting ahead of ourselves here, but imagine if it was purposeful. Imagine if somebody did it with, with nefarious intent to create confusion and economic and health and social damage. So, you know, it's, it's now an attack. And of course, we wouldn't question if it was our job to, to contribute to the, to the resolution, the prevention if we can, but resolution if we can't. So, so to me, it's, it's plain, and I'll, I'll finish with this too, Michael, it, it may well be analogous to the economic account. You know, we're not, we're not trying to replicate Wall Street and Bloomberg, et cetera, but we're trying to add value where we can and, and how we can, to Sue's point, and by the way, how we need to reimagine how we do that, how we can, uh, in a way that's advantage, advantageous to our uh, decision makers. So before we, we turn to, I think, the most interesting question of how we actually do the mission, um, General Hayden, anything you want to add about this question of what we should be focusing on and how we should think about transitioning our focus? Um, particularly away from counterterrorism and toward China. Yes, indeed. You know, I, I did a lot of times at, at NSA and at CIA uh, on terrorism, okay? And lots, lots going on. And I, I could see that, but I couldn't do anything about it, if you know what I mean, okay? So maybe if I was trying to do it Again, I would say, listen, that's important. And let's do something about that, not just about that, but about this instead. Okay, um, that's great. Um, and now I think we get to what Larry was talking about when he talked about the IC being at an inflection point, right? So it's really not about mission. To some degree, it's about what we're gonna focus on going forward. But as you all talked about, we gotta do everything at the end of the day. Um, making some choices here and there, but the expectation is that we'll show up with some understanding of an issue. So the question is, how do we do that mission, right? How do we do the collection? How do we do the analysis? Um, how much do we rely on open source? What's our relationship like with the private sector? Um, how do we get the talent we need? How do we think about talent perhaps differently than we used to, right? I think that's what Larry was talking about when he was talking about an inflection point. And maybe the place to start is just to get everybody's kind of general thoughts on this incredibly important question. And Sue, let's come back to you for a first shot here. Um, it's a world where all the threats today go to and through information. Um, we have got to be preeminent in the use of information. 
we just do. I don't, I don't know how you have an intelligence community that is lagging in terms of the ability to both have access to the information you need and to be able to analyze the information that is so abundant that you can't do it manually. So one way you do that is I think, I just believe we have to double down on our ability in data access. And I say that different from collection because I think it isn't necessarily a world where you're gonna scoop up the world's data and hold it for yourself, but you do need to be able to use any data that is useful to you. And we have got to be able to use machines to help us. So that's one. Um, two, um, I don't worry about our ability to attract talent because the mission is really quite compelling. Um, talent seeks quest and resources. So I think we have as good a quest as any, but I gotta tell you when we turn the talent that comes in the door into bureaucrats, when we try and hold them for 40 years and go through a step-by-step -step process, we have got to be able to move people in and out, even if they come in and use them at different times in our careers. We have got to break the bounds of the legacy of the collectors that we had as though we can just keep modifying to get to the new issues. I think we have got to really consider analytic tradecraft today. There, at the very least, every analyst has got to be comfortable with data and technology. We could talk about what happened with the 2016 Russian interference in part because while we all knew that Russia's intention was to undermine democracy, we didn't put it together with the phenomenal capability of cyber in a predictive way. So I've got to analytically bring technical acumen and social sciences and behavioral sciences all together. And then the last is we have different customers. We had different customers after 9-11. We had to get to state and local. We have different customers now that have to include the private sector and the citizens. Robert? Um, okay, again, thanks, Sue, everything. And- I'm here for you, Robert. I know you always are. Um, so, you know, 1947, you know, we were created uh, and fit for purpose. Sue talked about that purpose, right? Iron curtain, throw things up in the air, see, look on the other side, take pictures, steal secrets, and, and we serve the nation well. 1989, uh, joint force, um, smart weapons, uh, maneuver warfare. We caught up late, but got there in time, um, and we had the luxury of time. 2001, and while we were strategic, uh, uh, yeah, strategically and tactically, um, a surprised um, as a nation, we again went and made ourselves fit for purpose and, and served the country well. And you're asking the question now, are we fit for purpose? And for all the reasons that Sue said, I, I don't believe we are. And I'll talk about those in a minute. But what I what I worry about, what I worry about is that we won't have that demanding moment that that will create the change, some of which Sue spoke about, because we are a bureaucracy and, and, and we do have agency and departmental equities that we represent. And those are those are purposeful, meaningful, and, and had good reason when they were created. But what I worry about going forward is that that bureaucracy will not adapt and provide the agility, the, the time sensitivity, the innovation that I believe is demanded now of the intelligence community. And so I, I'm not saying we're going to reorganize. I, I know we won't. Okay. I'm not saying there's going to be some you know, huge change in the director of national intelligence authorities. I don't see that either. Um, what I think is needed is almost harder. And that's a reimagination of, of who we are and, and how we act. And I love Sue's verbs. You know, we have to be more comfortable with access before we collect and to tailor the latter. 
we have to be more comfortable with with talent coming and going. And in one area, and I know this is trite to say, but it's true, we've got to get better at risk. Um, you know, for, for almost all of them, I'll say all of my career, the way to make, if you're a GS-12, the way to make it to GS-13 was don't make any GS-12 mistakes. Just don't, and, and you'll make GS-13. And, and, and on the contrary, there wasn't a whole lot of fanfare and confetti for whatever a GS-12, you know, success was. Um, so we have, to, we have to challenge that. And I know that's really hard, and I know it's fundamental to who we are. Uh, but that's the conversation I think we need to have about uh, not just how we bring that talent in, how we how we let it go, how we bring it back, and how we raise it and, and reward it. John? I'll pick up on a point made by Sue and a point made by Robert. Um, the term information dominance was uh, quite popular about 15 years ago uh, as open source is becoming more and more uh, important. And I, I do agree that we need to have this, this dominance on information and not all uh, important information needs to be clandestinely acquired. There is so much more that is publicly available now, particularly in that digital domain, in the social media environment. And I really do think that um, the intelligence community really needs to tap into that as much as possible. And so also that we don't waste time and precious resources going after information in a clandestine manner that may be in fact available in some type of open source environment. That's number one. Number two, uh, I'm a liberal arts guy, but as you well know, I'm a, a wannabe systems engineer. <laughs> and I really am quite an advocate of much more integrated effort within the intelligence community and also within the US government. Uh, the, uh, the departments and agencies really are legacies uh, structures of what was created over the last uh, 100 plus years or so. And I think there have been some noble efforts to try to make this broader constellation of agencies and departments and authorities work more collaboratively together. But I, I do think that to deal with the challenges of the future, we need to have a much more integrated approach. Uh, I tried to do that at CIA when we did some reorganization there. But I think it needs to be broader than that, because if we're really going to be able to tackle a lot of these issues effectively, we need to be able to leverage optimally the capabilities, the authorities, the expertise, the resources that exist sort of throughout the U.S. government. Now, this is a major, major challenge, and I don't think it's going to happen with you know, one fell swoop. But I think to Robert's point, the, the demand signal that created, for example, the National Counterterrorism Center in the aftermath of 9-11, as well as some other types of things that happened over previous decades, I'm hoping we're not going to be faced with a 9-11 you know, in, in the cyber world to really take steps that we need to take. And when I talk about systems engineering, I'm not just talking about the IC or the US government, because I do think that there needs to be some unprecedented partnerships between the public sector and the private sector, particularly as we're dealing with cyber and digital matters. Uh, given the, the role that the private sector plays and the ownership of a lot of these systems and networks that they have. And so I, I do hope that as we go forward, dealing with the challenges of each day, that we keep an eye on the evolving nature of the future and what the U.S. government needs to do to adapt. And I really do think that's the key word, the government's ability to adapt to the new changes that are frequently technologically driven, but that, unfortunately, I think the constellation of departments and agencies right now are not as well prepared to deal with as they should be. Now, Michael, if I can just pick up on one of John's points there, one of the things that I noticed um, when I was principal deputy is so many more issues were economic, but the intelligence community played disproportionately with the National Security Council and much less so with the National Economic Council. As a matter of fact, the constructs were, were not similar at all, but if there was one bin that intelligence was in, it was national security, not na national economic. If I look at the world today, man, I would go really hard to include commerce in the national security conversation. I would want to include transportation in the national security conversation because when you don't include them, you bring it into the traditional defense intelligence 
construct and we tend to hold a little tighter than really realizing what's happening in the kind of the commercial issues that are certainly security issues but not the same kind of security issues. So I think there really is an evolution. John, I think you said it very well in terms of who's in this national security tent. And once you think about that, then you think about how intelligence serves all those people and it's not all the same. So General Hayden, um, Sue and John and Robert were in government um, after we were. Mm. Um, and they're describing what I think is a need for pretty significant changes in how we approach doing our jobs as intelligence officers. And I'm wondering if it, it does this sound to you as unprecedented or is, is there something in the past that, that, that this sounds familiar to? And is there a lesson learned from that? Or how do you think of, yeah. how do you think about how unprecedented this sounds? Yeah. That's really, that was really interesting because I'm, I'm thinking about way back when after World War II, okay, we had a plan, right? We, we did that okay for every, okay? And we did that for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, okay? But now I'm looking at it now and I'm saying, hmm, that was then, this is now. And this is very, very different. And so I, I like what we talked about now, saying there's something going on. So let's talk about it and do something more. And, and actually, and different. Yeah, let, me, let me ask what I think is a really hard question. Although John, you, you were able to pull this off at the agency is, how do you drive the changes that we're talking about here? While Stu still doing the day-to-day -day job of going to deputies meetings and principals meetings and briefings before Congress and visiting foreign intelligence chiefs around the world, how do you do the day-to-day -day and, and keep up with your inbox while you're driving the kind of changes that you're all talking about? How do you make that work? Let's John start with you since you really took this on. Well, I had the benefit of being at CIA and in the intelligence community and security environment for 25 years, um, and then another four years at the White House. So I felt as though I had a fairly good understanding of the agency's mission when I became CIA director. And I relied heavily on a lot of my deputies and advisors. But uh, I felt an obligation as a leader to leave the organization in better shape uh, for the future. I think each director ha has that responsibility to build upon the, all the work that their predecessors had put into the organization. So it is hard, it is tough, but I think one of the challenges for intelligence community leaders is it cannot be substance all the time. If you're running an organization, you're the CEO of that organization. Yes, you have a lot of responsibilities with liaison, with the White House, going to National Security Council meetings. You have to stay up on substance. But at the same time, you're the orchestra leader. You're the one that has to decide on you know, what parts of the orchestra need to sort of move around or be changed or whatever. And I, I just think it, it, it has to happen. Now, I think there can be um, some um, support that is provided by a number of these outside groups that really have looked at these issues and you know, advisory committees and other types of things that can give ideas. Uh, and I, I tapped into uh, previous experiences. I was very much an admirer of what happened with the Department of Defense and Goldwater Nichols. So the whole mission center construct was one that I both basically stole from the US military. And so, so I think that there is a, there really has to be that uh, determination on the part of leaders to spend time on organizational issues uh, to include diversity and you know personnel and other types of things. It cannot be substance all the time. Otherwise, an organization will, I think, atrophy from the standpoint of its organizational capabilities and heft. And Robert, you, you drove change at NGA. Can you talk about that experience? I can. Um, and again, I had the distinct, what I saw as an advantage of being born in the agency, 
Now the agency didn't exist, but that's a minor point. Um, but, but born in the profession of imagery analysis, uh, doing that, learning the business of intelligence through various opportunities, um, and then leaving the agency for almost 10 years. And so I got to learn what the agency was like both as a partner uh, when I was at Defense Intelligence Agency, and I got to learn what NGA was like as, uh, as, a, as a provider when I was at the White House and I was a demander. And so when I came back, Michael, I really had what I thought was a good sense that I, I was worried that our historic pride, which I shared because I was part of it, was gonna inhibit our future. And, and, and we were going to take that pride because of how well we had succeeded last year, last decade, and just go, it'll work tomorrow. And so without a, I guess, too clean of a, of a plan, uh, my idea was to do two things. One, uh, constructively disrupt. See if I could, I, it, it, I thought there was a false comfort there and I tried to challenge that. And two, my second recommendation probably should be my first is hire a world-class deputy, right? And, and get her in place and then give her the really hard uh, assignment of making the change. And uh, Sue, I'm gonna pivot to you because I'm proud of what we did together uh, by instilling the data science and the computational uh, literacy and the, and the move to commercial and public-private partnerships uh, but it does take a big team and a, and a strong deputy to do that. And so, 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 so you did that. Actually, you did it at the agency, you know, starting very early with InQtel and then a number of other initiatives. And then you did it at NGA and you tried very hard to do it as the PDDNI. Can you talk a little bit about lessons learned from driving change? I think you might be muted, Sue. Uh, man, and I was not going to have that happen today. Um, so I think you have to, as a leader, have a vision of where you're going to go. Right? It's not, it's not doing all the things you do. It's not even investing all the things you invest on. You have to decide what you, what you need to do. For John, when I had the good fortune of working for him, he came to me one day with a task of, Sue, I need you to figure out cyber for the agency. And what he really meant was figure out how we're going to operate in a digital environment. And that factored into his idea, and that is we needed to create much more integrated products and integrated approaches. For Robert, I think one of the things that Robert did with NGA is he had a vision that was not modernizing the mission of the agency. It was imagining the agency in the future, knowing what it must be and then building to that. So my favorite approach is to imagine the future, what you must be, and then decide what you need to do in order to get there and invest to accomplishment not just to capability. Because what we so often do is we decide all the things that are important to us and then we peanut butter spread our, our dollars against it, always feeling good that we're doing something good and we are always doing something good. And the question is, are we getting there? So to me, the issue is where do we need to get? And then you fund to achievement, not fun to capability. Capability, you can always stretch out. Achievement can't. I think we underuse our budget to be shaping. I think the DNI could use its budget authority more. I think each agency could. I think we need to stop building bottom-up budgets, asking everyone what they need to do the job because every job they're doing is important. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing it. But you can't build programs that way. We need to stop taking risk with the future. And by that, I mean putting off when we get there and start taking risk with the past. And so I think those are the things. And then the last is, and it's something I benefited from throughout my career. I had bosses who gave me impossible tasks and let me feel the weight of it. And I made my share of mistakes 
but what you got when you did that was the a kind of innovation you won't get any other way. And I think that John and Robert, and I hope I tried to push down responsibility when we had the vision. And what I think we could each say is we got something good every time we had the courage to ask somebody else to deliver on that. We're gonna shift to audience questions, but I wanna just ask General Hayden who drove significant change at NSA as director, um, drove change at CIA. If General, if you have one piece of advice for today's intelligence community leaders on driving change, what would you tell them? Do it, do it. That's, that's right. You know what I mean? All the times I would say, okay, I've done that. That's good. Well, okay, that's enough. And I'm looking back now and saying, oh, I could have done that one and that one and that one too. Just do it. Yes. And hire, hire good people and trust them to do the job. Okay. Um, our first question is, is it's fantastic that it's from a Shar School student. I had a hard time getting that out. Shar School student um, who's listening to all of this, right? And is wondering, gosh, what should I study? If I want to work in the intelligence community, what should I study? How should I prepare myself to deal with this world that you guys are talking about? Sue, your hand is still up, so I'm coming to you. Oh, shucks. Um, and I was trying to look down too, so you didn't come to me first. Okay. Um, I do think it's a technical world. Whatever you study, you need to be technically convert. You need to be comfortable with technology um, because it's just so many solutions are going through that. But at the exact same time, I really do want you to be a critical thinker. I think as technology becomes less the discriminator itself and more the use of technology becomes the nature advantage, I think people with great behavioral science foundation, great social science foundation, great ability to do critical thinking. I would encourage you to be a reader. So I can't pick one discipline. Um, physics is a great discipline because it's just so foundational. Geography is a great discipline because it's all about the contextual relationship of one thing to another. Economics, each of them are very good. But just remember when you're studying, at the end of the day, it's how are you gonna put it to use? And if you do those things, you're gonna be all right. So here's another great question. So somebody's pointing out here that since its creation, you know, the IC has only grown in the number of entities that are part of it. You know, should there, is there an argument, put it this way, is there an argument for a contraction? Is there an argument for consolidation? How do you guys think about that? And Robert, since you spent the most time in different places, let's start with you. Of course there is um, an argument there's, to be made for consolidation. Um, I just think it's unrealistic. So I, it feels, no offense to the Shar School, it feels a bit academic that, you know, we could say, well, what if this and what if that? But, you know, in our system uh, team, as I talked earlier about the agency prerogatives and the, and, the, and the departmental equities, et cetera, remember Congress gets a vote here and um, that's, not a, that's not an easy venue to, 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 to do a consolidation, Michael, because by definition, someone will be seen as losing you know, authorities, resources, control, whatever is the metric. And our system enables that veto. Uh, and I don't mean that in a presidential way, just in a decision-making way. So, M Michael, I think something truly traumatic would have to happen. I mean, a traumatic failure um, in order for that to happen. So, um, 
I apologize for uh, not answering the question because I, I, ju I just don't see it as realistic. I would take issue a bit with what Robert said. I think that um, if there was some contraction, I think it would force more efficiency. Um, and unfortunately, I think in the past, whenever problems have erupted, um, more money has been thrown at the IC and, and more uh, departments and components uh, you know, have grown up and it's become almost unwieldy. And I think trying to stitch together an interoperable system that is optimally configured has become more and more challenging. So I tend to be a contrarian on this issue. I would almost advocate for a 10% you know, cut or so. It would force those efficiencies within and among agencies so that they may be better outcomes as a result. John, John, I wasn't, you and I are in agreement. I'm, I'm happy to go on record and say that money is not the IC's problem. I was talking organizationally. Uh, and, and, I just, and I just see there's too many defenders of each of the organizations. That's the contraction that I don't see. I would, I'm gonna top your 10%, let's cut it 20% and see some real efficiencies. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll just- I was just gonna say we have two former PDD and I's here. Yep. We've got the last and we've got the first. Yeah. So love to hear what they have to say about this question. Um, so first things first, anytime you're listening to a former, you ought to take everything we say with a grain of salt, because by the way, we had our run. <laughs> and if we're saying that there are things undone, we, we should have done it. Um, I think I had this chance to consider the issue of contraction on my watch with, with Dan Coates. And I'm, I'd go even further. I'd say cut us in half, and I think we'd find our essential element and we'd grow from there. But I decided not to do it because I would have spent all my time fighting every single bureau, every single congressional committee, every single constituency. And so I, what I chose instead was to double down on connecting the information, believing that if we seamlessly could connect the information, we would find those moments where we were actually the same and then you would move from there. So I chose not to because I thought it would take my whole tenure and there were other changes that I needed, I believe we needed to affect. But I do believe if you could wave a magic wand, there is a kind of volumetric growth, like kind of like bleh, where we got more resources and what had been one job, it turned into three people doing the same job. But I chose not to because I felt I didn't have time to fight that battle. I wanted to instead say, how do we organize against some of the threats? But it's a, it's, it's a tough call. I'd love to hear what PDD-1 said. Yes, yes, PDD-1. Okay, I was there and I had a meeting and I said, uh, we want to oh, over there and over there and over there. It's not much money, but we want to take it. Okay? And they, they said, uh, no, I don't think so. And th that was the problem right there. You, Sue, you said something about that, right? And I did too, but we didn't do it. Had we so, had so, some, we could have chosen. Yeah, exactly. And I think expediency drove me in a different direction, but I think it will need to be done. Yep, indeed. So a question about, can the, can the country be confident that the intelligence community is working together as it should? Right, that there'll never be um, difficult question, right? But there'll never be another intelligence failure that is a result of people not working together properly. How much confidence do you have on where we are on that? And maybe a better a, a part of the question is how do you incentivize intelligence community officers to think of the whole community as a team? Um, in fact, even inside of an agency, how do you consider, how do you incentivize officers to work as a team? John, let's start with you. 
Well, I think the intelligence community certainly works more collaboratively together today than it did certainly prior to 9-11 and even in the decade after 9-11. So I think there has been this incremental progress made. Uh, and I think there are a number of ways that we can make the community work in a more integrated and therefore effective fashion. One is, um, one of the things I try to encourage CI officers to do is to uh, serve rotations in other organizations, because I think there is this parochialism that exists in certain agencies that they don't really understand the capabilities, the authorities, the expertise, all the things that other agencies have to bring to bear. And once they're exposed to that, and once they operate within those environments, I think they bring that back to those organizations. Secondly, I, I do think that there is a need for more integrated units so that we bring together the NGA folks, the CIA, NSA, and others that can work collaboratively in environment against certain tough issues. Sometimes it's done for task forces, but also I think there can be a more enduring collaborative sort of effort um, against some of these hard problems. And China is a great example. And I think it was pointed out before that bringing commerce and other organizations into that tent that is looking at these really difficult challenges to our national security, you need to bring the people together so they can work cheek to jowl day in and day out uh, on some of these problems. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, two things. One, um, I think John's right with respect to, um, uh, we, we, well, I know John's right with respect. We are, we are much more integrated. I mean, the first 15 years of my IC career were in the dark. Uh, not because I wanted to be, but it was just, it was just that way. I, I think we should tip our hat to the, our second director of national intelligence for, for initiating joint duty uh, assignments and mandating them for competitiveness for promotion to senior executive or senior intelligence service. That's rewarding what you want, right? You, you, want, joint, you want jointness, you want integration. Well, uh, assign it and reward it. Um, I might just scale as John was talking, you know, as, 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 as hesitant as I am to a reorg, maybe there is a mission center way ahead. I mean, a true mission center way ahead. And as a fan as I am of what John did at TTIC and NCTC, I think we all know too that every agency still sustains, maintains a terrorism center. It does, okay, and and we tolerate that uh, for different reasons, right? Mine's different because it's it's for this customer or that customer, and I'm not saying those people are wrong. It's just we we tolerate it, and so perhaps there is an opportunity where we could, and maybe maybe China's the case, or maybe economic intelligence. Sue's point about commerce and transportation is the case where because it's so new, China's not new, but the other aspects could be new that that we could come together in a different way and and truly you know, recreate our outcome without reorganizing the boxes. Let me ask a question about, um, I'm putting two questions together here and then I'm adding a little part of what I wanted to be my last question to you all. Um, but a not insignificant share of the American population because of the last four years um, believes that the intelligence community is part of this deep state idea, right? And believes that the intelligence community is not working on behalf of the national security of the United States. They actually believe that the intelligence community is undermining the country. So how should we, how should intelligence community leaders talk to the country about what it's doing, how it's doing it, how do we educate those people who um, have this fundamentally flawed view of who we are and what we do? Who wants to go first? Well, I, I can do that, okay? Because I did it for 10 years, okay? And it's, it was very interesting, but it's also important. Tell them what to do. You know what I mean? And if we don't do that, then okay, that, that's a real problem. And by the way, I can see you, you're, you're involved, you're involved, you're involved, you're involved. That's important. That's very important. I'm gonna, I'm gonna date myself now and say we should all be like Mike um, because what General Hayden did for our profession 
I think as sir, as much as you did for 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 literally transforming our national security agency and for leading the Central Intelligence Agency and being our first principal deputy, you were a spokesman for our profession, and and, and you and you did it in such an American way. It was clear and non technical, and it and it was purposeful, and with commitment. And frankly, we all need to be more like Mike. We, we, we have to have that conversation because you're right, Michael, this is dangerous. Um, I said earlier that, that the, it, it's, it's, it's just an idea, team, uh, this form of government we've chosen uh, to adhere to. And that idea doesn't work if those that, that are governed don't believe in it. It just doesn't work. And so um, I think now we have to be careful here because of um, some history, but I don't. I, I I don't think being careful means we 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 can't get out there and have the conversation. So I, I think we have to engage the American public. We got to win their trust back, um, because quite frankly, as Sue said earlier, they're the ones who placed it in us to begin with, and uh, and we have to we have to we have to earn it. John, Sue, do you want to add anything? I'd say obviously we're in a hyper-partisan environment right now, uh, unlike any that I've seen in my, my lifetime, and uh, very polarized as, as a country. And anytime someone speaks out, including intelligence leaders, it's you know, potentially going to alienate you know, one side of that ideological spectrum or the other. But I, again, it gets to the point that was made earlier on, I think Sue's first comments to your initial question was, we are supposed to be speaking truth. We're not supposed to be partisan at all. We're supposed, not supposed to be ideological. We're supposed to be speaking the truth to our customers and also when we can and should to the American public. And so, yes, we're going to be caught in this whirlwind of politics when we appear in front of Congress or that we speak out publicly. But I think that's one of the you know, responsibilities of intelligence leaders. Um, I think all of us have been equal opportunity offenders in terms of the different parts of the aisle that we upset when we talked uh, about uh, intelligence matters um, because we don't have agendas. And I think that's so critically important for intelligence leaders not to have these partisan agendas, despite the fact that they frequently will be labeled as partisans because of the positions they take. So I mean, yeah, I remember I had a conversation once with former president Trump, I think it was right after the uh, worldwide threat assessment briefing. And I, and I said, you do know that when the intelligence community um, says difficult things that serves you well, right? The, that the American people need to know that for good, bad, or indifferent, it is giving the best it has without shading toward a particular outcome. Um, so, so I think we need to talk about our discipline. I think there's something heroic about it when it's practiced well. I think you're right, Michael, it's been impugned and I hate that, but it can be overcome by our actions, by our constancy. I do think we have to be able to talk publicly about it, uh, Robert said this so eloquently about General Hayden, you know, post Snowden, when the intelligence community could not figure out how to talk about itself, he stepped in and gave us voice. And he countered a narrative that was only one-sided. And we need to do that now um, more than ever. I talked to a lot of students and one of the things I always say is I wish people knew us because I think what most people would find is we're just like them, we're your neighbors. We think about the world in the same terms in general that the American people do. And I think we have to be true. We have to fight against becoming staid and becoming narrow and becoming stodgy. We have got to be mindful of the trust that's instilled in us um, and be worthy of that. And then we have to be able to talk about it openly because this is a world that can't live in the shadows. So I want to give each of you about 30 seconds to 60 seconds just for any final, final thoughts. Um, Robert. Um, thank you. 
uh, Michael, um, Larry, General Hayden, uh, George Mason for putting this together. This, this, I thought it'd be fun and it was fun. It's great to have this conversation. Michael, I, I, I'm an optimist and, and, and I believe our future is bright and we, we are going to have to fight for it. Um, John said polarized. I think that's, that's kind. <laughs> Um, there's, there, there's very little in the middle these days. There's very little, uh, conversation that's, uh, uh, moderate. And I don't mean that in a political sense. And so I, I, I think, I think more than ever, America needs, uh, its intelligence professionals to, uh, to not only do its job, but to, to explain it in a way that comports with our values, uh, which it defends and that it protects um, our security going forward. And so I think this is a conversation that has to continue and, uh, and I'm happy to be part of it. I'm happy to learn from each of you uh, as we have it and, um, and, and, and look forward to, to doing that with all of you. John? Since there are so many students that are listening, uh, just following up on the question earlier about what you should study, whatever it is that interests you and motivates you, study it with a passion and with an enthusiasm, because almost any discipline, I think CI has about 65 or 66 professional disciplines these days, you can find a role uh, in the intelligence community or the national security structure. And if you're looking for a career that really is going to be so rewarding in terms of what you do day in and day out, working with you know, world-class experts, as well as with tremendous patriots, I really do think that the intelligence community, uh, as well as the broader national security community, law enforcement, diplomacy, military, are really looking to tap into that tremendous, tremendous wealth within our melting pot that is called America. So again, study uh, as best you can uh, and what it is that you like to do uh, and really seriously consider uh, a future uh, for you uh, in terms of your profession somewhere in that uh, US government uh, superstructure. Sure. Um, don't be daunted. You know, this is, a, this is a moment where it all seems almost intractable, but there have been times in our past where it, I guarantee you it has seemed equally intractable and yet we found our way. Um, we found our way by digging in, diving in, believing that we must, and then using all the talents that we had available to us. So I think what I'd tell you is believe, be big, work hard and make the national security tent really big and we'll find our way. General Hayden. Very simply, tell the truth, tell the truth. So let me, let me thank all of you for joining us. Um, it's been amazing. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Larry. Wow, that was... Uh... That was just as remarkable, maybe that was more remarkable uh, than, than I thought it would be. So thank you all very, very much for joining us. Uh, you've provided our students with a lot of great insights. You've provided interested people in the public uh, uh, knowledge about the Intel community, where it's headed. Uh, and that's everything we're trying to accomplish here. Um, glad to have you, uh, Sue and John, back for a second round. Uh, Robert, we'll take you up on your offer to get more involved there. Thank you. I worry a little bit that the only news we made tonight was that uh, we should cut the IC budget by 50% and the guys are going to go to work tomorrow morning, read the media highlights and say, what were they saying? Um, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens there. So thank you again. Uh, General Hayden, uh, any final comment? It was wonderful. Let's do it again. Absolutely. Mark? I think let's do it again is absolutely right. I thank all of you for your participation, your contribution to the Hayden Center events and Michael Morell asked the question, what can you do better to educate the public so that people have a greater understanding of the role of intelligence in our society? And I just want to say we appreciate what all of you are doing because you're all public intellectuals in a sense. You're all reaching out to the public through various fora, including these events at the Shar School where, where we're trying to do our little part uh, to educate the broader public. And thank you, Michael Hayden, for the Hayden Center and making this all possible. So this is a great way to end the academic calendar year at the Shar School at George Mason University. But as I said at the opening, the Hayden Center continues. So look forward to the next event. 
go on Twitter and follow the Hayden Center uh, Twitter account, as well as the Shar School of Policy and Government, or go to our websites and you can see what's coming up in our future programs. Thank you, everybody, and good night. Thank you.